And I think I see my good friend Hubert Humphrey coming in here now, Rust, and we'd like to talk to him if we can. Good morning. Good morning, Senator. Good morning. Um, um, Senator, I'm very happy indeed to see you, and I was with you yesterday for a while. I know how deeply this has affected you. Would you mind uh, telling us something of your ideas now, either on what has happened or what will happen? I should explain Senator Humphrey is the Democratic whip of the Senate, works under Senator Mike Mansfield, the Democratic leader. Well, uh, Bob, that uh, I'm still somewhat in the state of, uh, well, of confusion and of such deep uh, concern and shock that uh, I haven't been able to really get myself functioning like I would like to. This is a real fact and one that's uh, very troublesome. I was at the, uh, Mrs. Humphrey and I, I should say, were at the Chilean embassy yesterday for a luncheon. By the way, I, I don't believe I've accepted one lunch in years uh, to be away from the capital at noontime, but uh, the Chilean ambassador is a very kind and gracious man, and he'd been to my home state of Minnesota, and I thought I ought to uh, reciprocate and at least accept an invitation, and I was there with uh, Ralph Dungan and others uh, uh, at... Uh, Mr. Duncan being the former, or the late President Kennedy's uh, assistant. And the news came uh, to us that the president had been shot at that time, wounded. And, of course, like others, we hoped and prayed that uh, the wound wasn't as serious as the first news uh, reports indicated. And, of course, the, I received a telephone call from the White House. And uh, I was told that the president had, uh, had passed away, that he'd been killed. I then, all at once, it dawned on me that uh, the closeness of relationship, uh, it, this is something that I've been reflecting upon. I, I'd worked with President Kennedy, and uh, I'd been a colleague of his in the Senate, and as we all know, I'd been a contestant with him in the primaries, and then I became a lieutenant of the presidents in the legislative program, and uh, I worked very closely with him and had a very friendly and warm uh, personal relationship. But when that news came that he had been taken from us, that he'd been shot, I stood uh, alone in the in the hallway of the embassy, and uh, I'm not ashamed to say I just couldn't contain myself. I just broke down and sobbed because it seemed like a bit of life had gone right out of me. And then to try to tell others to come to the table and to tell the guests and the host that we'd lost our president was... Uh, a very, very difficult assignment. And so during that day of yesterday and this morning, it all seems like, a, it, it just seems like it's not reality. I keep hoping that somehow or another that this is one of those m moments that uh, just isn't true, that it's unreal, that it's, an, uh, that it's an ugly dream. But of course it is real. We have to face up to it. Uh, I, Mrs. Humphrey and I were at the airport at Andrews Air Base last night when the president's body was brought back. I, care, I, I still see my old friend and the president's intimate personal friend, Dave Powers, uh, there with his beloved friend, President Kennedy, and Larry O'Brien, Kenny O'Donnell, these wonderful men that worked uh, with President Kennedy. And they were there with him to the very last moment. They were there as they tenderly and uh, lovingly brought his body uh, back to the nation's capital. And then I saw Mrs. Humphrey and I saw Mrs. Kennedy. That poor lady, what she has gone through, losing her baby, and now her husband, and yet the strength and the, the poise that she demonstrates is an inspiration to all of us. I uh, haven't had a chance to see her yet. Mrs. Humphrey hasn't. But uh, I know that she realizes, that we, knows that we are really are uh, with her in spirit and, and in prayer and in sympathy. So we, uh, later on during the night, uh, moved to uh, uh, see the uh, new president, President Johnson. I want to say a word about that, Bob. Is it all right just to uh, very much go so on and talk to you about it? it? Yes. Uh, all during my service in the Senate, I've been a close uh, friend of uh, President Lyndon Johnson. You know, it's very difficult to uh, to change terminology because I've always thought of President Johnson as Lyndon. 
uh, but now it's President Johnson. And I know, I know of his sterling qualities of leadership and his uh, unique ability uh, to, uh, to perform the art of politics. He really is a competent stat tactician, a leader, born leader. He loves public service. But I want to say one other thing about him. I watched him as the, uh, the companion and the, and, the, uh, and the supporting arm of uh, President Kennedy, our late and beloved President Kennedy. And he was intensely loyal to President Kennedy. Even when there were little things said that might have tried, that could appear to divide them, he never let that happen, nor did President Kennedy let that happen. I was with them morning after morning at breakfast, as you know. Every Tuesday morning we'd have breakfast at the White House. I sat right next to President Johnson as the vice president then and right across the table from the president. I know the exchanges that took place. Uh, I've kept little notes of this. And the warmth of feeling, the friendliness uh, that was there, and the give and the take, the good humor, and yet the, also the seriousness of purpose. I was there, I know, you see. I literally rubbed arms uh, with the vice president, now the president, and looked right into the eyes of the president right across the table, President Kennedy. And I want to say now, so that there can never be any doubt about it, that the, the loyalty, the, <clears throat> the faithfulness to the man of, uh, that Vice President Johnson at that time had to President Kennedy was beyond doubt. It was, was marvelous. He was dedicated to him. And the Vice President was dedicated to President Kennedy's program, and he will continue to be. I happen to know and that he will consider one of the memorials that we can leave or can give to President Kennedy is the fulfillment of President Kennedy's program uh, because this this is the living memorial. I watched uh, Vice President Johnson as Vice President, I should say, uh, go to uh, great uh, great limits, almost beyond his strength, to uh, to fulfill tasks for uh, President Kennedy. Then, so this this spirit of understanding and friendship must be clearly understood in the American public, and I think it is. And I want our friends overseas to know too that in President Johnson, you have one who worked alongside of President Kennedy. You had one that is dedicated to the same program, to the same international commitments, to the love of this republic, to the love of freedom, political freedom, all the freedoms. And I, am, I, am, I must say that uh, while our forefathers uh, had such foresight in giving us a political system where there can be a transfer of power without the contest for power, without a struggle for power, where we have political institutions that can endure any, almost any kind of pain and, and crisis, that uh, God Almighty has been uh, very good to us too. Uh, we have men that are trained for these jobs. And uh, in America with uh, Lyndon Johnson, the President of the United States now, we have a man that is trained for the job, that is an experienced leader, that is dedicated to political life and to the principles of democracy. We're fortunate, very, very fortunate. Thank you very much, Senator, and perhaps you'd like to stay for just a moment because I'm going to switch to Peter Hackers out at President Johnson's home, Les Ormes. Peter, are you there? President Lyndon Johnson has just left his home here in uh, northwest Washington on a 10 or 12 minute ride uh, downtown to the executive office building. There were three cars. The first one was the Secret Service car, called affectionately the Queen Mary. Then came the President's car. He was seated in the rear seat on the right next to the window. As I saw him, when he pulled out of the driveway, his face was uh, drawn in a rather determined look. So as of this moment, Lyndon Baines Johnson has left his home for his first day of duty as the nation's 36th President. This is Peter Hackett, NBC News, outside the Johnson home in Washington. This is Russ Ward in the NBC newsroom in New York. As we continue our coverage of the tragic events surrounding the death of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. As you have heard, the body of the nation's 35th president is now in repose this morning in the East Room of the White House. It was taken there early this morning from the Bethesda, Maryland Naval Hospital... Throughout the day, the President's family, his close friends, and top officials of the United States government will view the body. Tomorrow, it will be borne by solemn cortege to the rotunda of the Capitol, 
where it will lie in state for 24 hours and be viewed by the public. Funeral services to be held at noon Monday at St. Matthew's Roman Catholic Cathedral in Washington. The final resting place for the 46-year-old president, still uncertain at this time. Robert McCormick, if you are in our Washington newsroom, may I ask if uh, you have any details on uh, plans for U.S. government offices uh, for Monday, uh, schools, offices, uh, uh, how will the city of Washington pay tribute on the day of the president's funeral? To the best of my knowledge, there's been no formal announcement about it yet, but I assume that uh, I'm quite sure that the government employees will be allowed to pay their respects to the president at the Capitol as he lies in the state and as the cortege goes from the White House to the Capitol. Uh, Senator Humphrey, have you heard anything about that by any chance? No, I have not, and uh, but I'm confident that the appropriate announcement will be made very shortly, and the, uh, all of the course, all of the arrangements will uh, be properly outlined. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Bob, last night as I sat in my office and after visiting with President Johnson, as you recall, a number of the congressional leaders were at President Johnson's office for about 45 minutes, where we had a very intimate, personal talk with the, the new president pledging our loyalty and our support and our helpfulness. I went back to my own office. I just sort of wanted to uh, be alone a little while. And while I was there, the phones kept ringing. I had no secretarial staff there because I had asked them to go to their respective homes. My office people knew President Kennedy and they were terribly upset with this tragic loss. That, those phones kept ringing in about... I, and they were all long-distance calls from back out in Minnesota, practically all of them. One or two other calls from friends of mine, New York and Chicago. And without exception, the calls were filled with, with love for uh, the late president and uh, with grief, with sadness. I remember the, the final call that I took just before I went to my own home here in uh, Chevy Chase, Maryland, was from a gentleman who was a taxicab driver out in St. Paul. He had just finished work, and he'd gotten home, and he called up, wanted me to, to know how he felt and how his family felt. And he wanted me to tell the family of President Kennedy how, how he and his family uh, grieved for them. You know, this is the kind of thing that I think tells the story of, uh, of love and affection for a man uh, more so than even headlines or anything that those of us in public life can say. And I, I just went home filled with... Well, with emotion because of not only the day, but because of what people had told me, just just folks that I know back home. We are accustomed here to considering the president as the man next door, as our neighbor. We have a much warmer, much closer feeling to them, we always thought, than people around the country. But from what you say, that may not be true. Uh, perhaps President Kennedy was the man next door to everyone. I think that's very true, and also I, I sometimes feel that in the, in the expression of freedom which we have in America, in this very free freedom that we have, that sometimes we uh, give people the, uh, the feeling that uh, there isn't much respect for public office or even for the high office of presidency. <coughs> but you know, it, when the moment of, of crisis comes, like uh, as it did in the Cuban crisis, or when it, a moment of tragedy comes as it did yesterday when President Kennedy was taken from us, then all at once you see the American people as they really are, a thoughtful people, a considerate people, an emotional people, and a warm and, and friendly people, and, uh, and their love for their president is, is genuine and sincere very, very much. It's, uh, I remember when President Roosevelt uh, passed away, and I remember then the... Uh, the feeling of loneliness and of personal loss. And I can remember when uh, uh, President Eisenhower was stricken with a heart attack. And I remember the feeling of concern that came across the whole nation. And now uh, I have witnessed uh, this deep personal feeling that, that people have about our beloved late President Kennedy. And I can honestly tell you, Bob, that when I got the news, I felt that just a part of my life had, this, had left me. I didn't, as I said, I didn't even know I felt that way. That's, that's really the truth. I, I knew I thought a great deal of the president, and, I, uh, and I, my relationships were extremely cordial. In fact, just Wednesday of this week, uh, 
We were joking and having a great time. I was walking with him over to the White House and in the garden and having a wonderful, wonderful visit just like two friends would have. But then all at once when uh, a terrible moment of tragedy comes and death takes uh, your friend, then you realize that something is gone. Uh, it's so, so <laughs> we articulate fellows find no words to, to really explain it. And yet with all of that, Senator Humphrey, the... As you said about President Johnson, when he steps into the job, he no longer is Lyndon, he's Mr. President. That's right, and he takes on entirely new responsibilities, and in a sense, he becomes a new person. Uh, I know that he will become a, a fine president, and I say this with, our, with all respect uh, and with great respect for the one that has departed, that uh, President Johnson um, has fine and great qualities of national leadership, of leadership for this nation. And the people throughout the world uh, should literally uh, be prayerfully grateful that out of, the, out of the plain folk of this country comes a man that uh, is so extremely well uh, qualified for public service and for leadership as President Johnson. And I look forward to working with him. I, I literally held his hand last night and pledged my personal as well as public support uh, to his efforts, because I know he needs it. Believe me, he needs it in this job. Uh, and you are one of those who has the has the extremely trying task of keeping the government going at a time when actually you don't feel like going much yourself. That's about right. Well, we'll keep the government going, and we have jobs to do and work to do, and a brave people in a big country, in a strong country, must be able to uh, not only to well not only to express its sorrow and its sympathy and its love and affection but it must also stand strong and carry on and I, I know that the greatest tribute and the greatest memorial that we could give to the memory of uh, President Kennedy is to carry out what he started out to do and he did so many great things he revitalized our national power and he he brought to us a, a new respect throughout the world. He, he contributed so much to the cause of peace. And he has worked so hard for human dignity and human rights. All of these, all of these pledges and promises and all of these beginnings now we must continue. And I'm sure that we're going to be able to do that because we have a continuity of leadership. Isn't that marvelous that we have a continuity of policy, philosophy, and of, and of, uh, and of program. Uh, I think this bodes well for the nation. Well, thank you very much, Senator Humphrey, and thanks for coming up here, and thanks for a very revealing insight on something most of us really haven't had time to think about, had neither the time nor the will to think about. Robert and Senator Humphrey, allow me to interrupt just a moment. Uh, newspapers abroad this morning are likening this tragedy to the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, in that both Lincoln and President Kennedy were fighters for civil rights. And knowing uh, Senator Humphrey's feelings about civil rights, uh, about equal rights for all, I wonder if he would comment on uh, what this may mean to the President's uh, civil rights program. Well, you know, uh, just as you were speaking, I was saying to uh, uh, Bob McCormick here that I... I was, was racing through my mind the very same thought that this is 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, this is uh, the Emancipation year, so to speak, centennial. And President Kennedy has taken such a brave and uh, noble position on the issue of human rights. Not a position that was... Uh, radical or that was uh, extreme, but one that was within the spirit of the Constitution and within the spirit of our philosophy of life and of our democratic way of life. And I'm sure you realize and recognize with me that the then Vice President and now President Johnson was, was one of the most uh, brilliant and one of the most dedicated and, and uh, sincere spokesmen these years of President Kennedy's administration for the doctrine of human rights and for civil rights. It is most interesting me, to me to see how this man from Texas uh, really stood up on this great and fundamental issue of our time of human rights. I remember President Johnson's speech at Gettysburg uh, 
Uh, I believe it was uh, right around the 4th of July, as I recall. I placed that speech in the record. I was going to place it in the record, and someone beat me to it in the congressional record, as I recall, someone there first. But that was a remarkable speech. I want to get that out and read it once again, because I, <clears throat> I was inspired by it at the time that I read it. This is the speech of President Johnson's in 1963. It was, uh, it was in the spirit, really, of the Gettysburg Address of Abraham Lincoln. And both of these great emancipators, Abraham Lincoln and President Kennedy, were taken from us by the assassin's bullet. And, as you may recall, President Lincoln was succeeded by President Johnson. Yes, and uh, President Johnson was a border state man, as I recall, from Tennessee. And he tried to carry out the policy of reconciliation with the South of Abraham Lincoln. And here is President Kennedy being succeeded by President Johnson from Texas. In a situation that Very is much the uh, same. Very much the same. Uh, don't we, some, haven't we overlooked the fact that uh, President Johnson had a great deal of the responsibility for getting through the last Civil Rights uh, Act, the first one we'd had since Reconstruction Days in 58, I think it was. Wasn't it? I should say so. The first major piece of civil rights legislation to pass in over 80 years was passed under the leadership of uh, President Johnson. And I want to say the one other thing. That's when President Johnson was majority leader in the Senate. He worked closely with the Republican president. I think we ought to understand that uh, while we have our party differences in this country, that I've never known a responsible leader in America that didn't put his country above his party. And uh, the uh, warmth of friendship and the closeness of relationship between the former President Eisenhower and now President Johnson is a matter of record in history and is a living fact today. And what a, what a great thing this is, because President Johnson can draw upon the experience of President Eisenhower and President Truman. President Truman was a warm and intimate friend, and is today, of uh, President Johnson. And all of these great men who have given so much to their country, including President Hoover, who is a, a man that is in many is in years uh, now, they can all give so much now to our new president in advice. Well, thank you once again, Senator Humphrey. And everything you say was quite correct. And uh, so now I think uh, we'll give you a rest and go back to Russ Ward in New York. Thank you, Robert, and thanks, too, to Senator Hubert Humphrey, Minnesota. The body of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, now in repose at the White House, to be viewed today by close friends and government officials, tomorrow to be taken to the rotunda of the Capitol, where it will lie in state for 24 hours and be viewed by the public. The NBC Radio Network has canceled all regularly scheduled programs to bring you this continuous coverage of the events surrounding the death of the late President of the United States, John F. Kennedy.